Welcome to Doc Talk, a weekly podcast featuring Monument Health physicians addressing medical topics. Tune into your health with Monument Health. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Doc Talk. My name is Mark Houston. Of course, we're uh, associated with Monument Health, and we have been having some wonderful conversations over the months talking to all kinds of different doctors that work at Monument, and I'm excited to have Dr. Matthew Witteroff, a general surgeon, with us today. Hello, doctor. Hey, how are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, now, you uh, are South Florida, yep. Southern Yes. <laughs> and you're up here in the cold. Yeah. So many of you are here. <laughs> yes, I know. I why, know. Why? What brought you up here, doctor? What's, uh, you know, yeah. what's the story? Well, yeah, like you said, I'm originally from South Florida, which mm-hmm. I don't even know if that's the South. That might be more kind of the Caribbean and Latin oh, yeah, America right, mixed almost. with New York and mixed with a little bit of Southern. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm from there. Um, when I um, finished with medical school down in Miami, Florida, I ended up going to residency at the University of Iowa. So that's actually what kind of got me out of South Florida. And towards the end of my training at the University of Iowa, I was kind of looking at where I wanted to go. And, um, you know, I looked at the coast. I looked at home for sure and just felt like the hustle and bustle of these larger cities wasn't exactly what I was looking for and wanted to, you know, um, ease into my career and and, um, not have to necessarily deal with all the competition. So, um, and, you know, I think the main driver just to get out of Iowa was to find a place that had scenery, you know, and, and so I came here for an interview because a friend of mine at residency um, was from here and almost took a job here. Um, and he told me about it and said it was the greatest place. And when we came to interview, we, my wife and I just kind of fell in love with the place just after three days and decided that was it. So, And, and you've been here about six and a half years, I yep. think, something like that. Exactly. exactly. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's got to be the, the work that you do. Uh, I, I was watching uh, your video on the Monument Health um, website there, and you say you come from a family of doctors as well, yes, right? Yes, yes. Like, do you know yeah. how far back it goes? Is it, is it, it kind of just in your blood to do uh, this, you think? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to my grandfather, actually. Um, and so he was a, kind of a uh, – medicine was different back then, but he was essentially a primary care doctor. Um, and then, you know, both my parents are doctors, my aunt and uncle and oh, my wow. cousin and my sister and – you know, my daughter's probably gonna be a plastic surgeon or something. So (laughs) it's just, it's just kind of flowing. And it's, um, it's something that gets presented early on in our family as a career opportunity. And, you know, I kind of knew I was going to be a doctor from a very young age. I didn't know what type of doctor, but I pretty much knew at a very young age that I was going to be a doctor. Well, and it shows, I mean, you, you seem very passionate about this too. And um, really quick, I'll kind of let you tell this story a little bit, but you had you had mentioned something in that video that people can find at Monument Health about being at a conference. And when you were all done talking, you because you mentioned primary care. Right it, right. it seems to me that after I watch that, that I can tell that you're somebody that wants results. Yeah. And you want them immediately. Not can, only do I want the results, that? but I want to be the one creating the result. Even better. And that's, and that's what drew me to surgery because, you know, in those conferences, some doctors, you know, we sit there, we discuss it, we come up with a plan. And then while other doctors were going to get a coffee, take a coffee break, we were going and throwing on some gloves and a gown and, you know, fixing the problem, cutting out the tumor or, you know, whatever, whatever it needed with our hands. And that's just what drew me to it. And, you know, the, the long hours and all these other stressors just weren't anywhere near a big enough obstacle for me to, you know, not go into it. So this was, this was for me. And if I had to do it again, it would definitely be surgery. Uh, so that kind of leads us into what we want to talk about today, which is uh, trauma surgery. And you and I, <clears throat> excuse me, we're talking a little bit before we got started about what that word means. When people hear trauma, um, it's such a, it's such a, it covers so many different things. Um, yeah. But what, uh, how do you define it? Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, trauma is some sort of external force, and that's a very broad term, mm-hmm. um, has, has come in contact with our body and then potentially caused an injury. So it's an external force. So if somebody comes in and they've got a, you know, gallbladder attack, while that may be traumatizing, that's not trauma. If somebody gets hit with a baseball bat, if somebody's in a car accident, if somebody gets stabbed or shot, if somebody falls off a building and hits the ground, those are all traumas. Those kind of physical, you know, interaction with the external world potentially causing injury. And um, 
And so our mentality when we're dealing with trauma is um, it's kind of like a black box. When a patient comes in, <clears throat> you hear what happened to them, but you don't necessarily know what injury it's caused. And so our brains immediately go to kind of a systematic approach of trying to figure out, well, what could have happened and how do we rule it out and what do we need to do to kind of assess a patient? Um, one of the biggest kind of things that we think about in the very beginning when we're assessing a trauma patient is something called mechanism of action. And that's key. Okay. So mechanism of action. So what exactly um, caused the trauma? I'll give you an example. We have a one of the most common types of traumas is called a motor vehicle collision. Mm -hmm. Either you, you know, usually you're in a car and you get into a car accident, you know, basically it's a car accident. Now, what was the mechanism of action? Were they going five miles an hour and just a fender bender? Were they going 60 miles an hour? Did the car run off the road? Did it flip a bunch of times? Did it land in a ditch or hit a tree? Um, one of the most important things, were the people seat belted? Did they have their seat belts on or did they not have their seat belts on and they were just thrown around the car? Or were they thrown through the window and found, you know, 20 feet away from the car? You have to take all of that into consideration, don't exactly. you? Exactly. From, from a five mile an hour trip to, a, a, you know, a car that's rolled 13 times. Right, right. And so then how does that impact what you do? How does that, how does that affect what you do? Right. So when we, when, we think, when we think mechanism of action, we think it's severe enough. And that's kind of a, a thing that we just sort of, you know, we take into account the facts. But then as a doctor, as an ER physician or a trauma surgeon or whatever, even an orthopedic surgeon, a neurosurgeon, we try to, you know, think of maybe the worst case scenario and we're looking to rule all of that out. So that's, so, so that, <clears throat> what would your role be then in this uh, right. as, as that general surgeon when this trauma happens? What's specifically, when do you spring into action with it? Then? Right. Um, most of the time we know about the traumas coming in from wherever they're coming from, from the scene, you know, anywhere in this general area. Um, and so we hear the mechanism of action and oftentimes it's even just a nurse who's kind of triaging things and saying, okay, this one needs, you know, the trauma surgeon here in four hours or maybe not at all. This one needs a trauma surgeon here in 15 minutes, you know, get here right now. And basically if we're called in and the moment we arrive, we essentially assume leadership of the entire, you know, running of the trauma, so to speak. And so you know, there's dozens, if not hundreds of different factors that we take into account. And so we have to gather that information and then we start to say, okay, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this to rule out that situation or rule out that situation. Um, a big, a big kind of um, decision tree point where things either go one way or the other in terms of mechanism of action is this concept of blunt force trauma versus penetrating trauma, okay? So blunt force trauma is, for example, a baseball bat. It's falling off a, a cliff while hiking. Mm -hmm. It's getting into a motor vehicle collision. Whereas penetrating trauma is a stab wound. It's a gunshot wound. It's you know a situation where a physical object has actually kind of um, you know impaled or has somehow injured and entered the body versus just a blunt force to it. And um, for example, when a patient is in a car accident, they could have hit their head, they could have broken their leg, they could have done all these different things. They could have, you know, shaken up the organs on the inside, they could have broken ribs, all these different things. But if I shoot you in the arm with a gun, well, you probably don't have a problem with your leg, you probably don't have a problem with your chest or your head, but you might have a very serious problem with your arm. And so we're more focused in that sense. Um, kind of the, the cool thing about about penetrating trauma, sort of, is that that's a, where a lot more of the action is. Mm -hmm. If you get shot in the abdomen or you get shot in the chest, the chance of you going to the operating room are a lot higher than if you know someone just pushed you down a flight of stairs. Um, so, so we we sometimes talk about you know when we're talking about training for trauma, we want to be around more penetrating trauma because that's where we're going to harness our skills more. Um, the flip side is that wherever there's good training and trauma, it's also just flat out dangerous to live. <laughs> sure. um, so a lot of times we get in, we get our training, then we get out. You know, um, <laughs> I can, I can, I can hear when you talk about this, I can hear the, the, 
the the excitement that kind of gets into your voice, the passion that kind of gets into this. And that is exactly the doctor I want if any of this trauma happens. I mean, you you obviously uh, are are ready to go at a moment's notice, yeah. right? And as you as you're talking about this, and and when people come in, this kind of leads to the next question of uh, trauma centers. Okay, right? How are they? Is that the is that what we know as an emergency room, or is that something different? Right. Yeah, it's something different. So an emergency room is a, you know, a department in, in a hospital that handles kind of everything that comes in, whether it's a true emergency or not, that's just kind of the place that anybody mm-hmm. can go, okay? A trauma, we've kind of talked about the definition of it, there's that specific definition, um, needs to be routed to places that are used to handling trauma. Most of the time, the trauma center is in or a part of the ER, Got Sometimes okay. they're a little bit separate, mm-hmm. but most of the time they're in or a part of an ER. There can be ERs that do have a trauma program, or there can be ERs that don't have a trauma program. And then from my understanding, there are there are five levels of trauma center, correct? Yeah, four or five. Four or five in that area. Well, that's what we are here. Monument Health Rapid City Hospital is a level two trauma center. Correct? Right, right. So what does what does what does that mean for for you and and for Rapid City? Right. Yeah. No, a level two trauma center is a big deal. Okay? Really? Okay. It's a big deal. Um, these designations are given by the American College of Surgeons. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to, you know, hand them the paperwork to show that we are a level two mm-hmm. trauma center. This is how many traumas we see. This is what we do for them. Um, so it's a big deal. Um, a level two trauma center can essentially handle probably over 90% of all traumas that come in. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so the higher the number of trauma center level, that doesn't matter. The less right? important okay. it becomes, the <laughs> less right. they can do, the, the more they're just... Maybe they're seeing, you know, a, a trauma. Maybe it has to go there because that's the closest place. Yep. And maybe the doctor just goes Eek! and just sends it, <laughs> you know, to immediately to a level two or a level one trauma center. But they can maybe do a quick few things, get an mm-hmm. IV, get some fluids going. You know, they ha- have just a little bit of basic training. Okay. Um, but they know they need to get it out. Um, at a level two trauma center, I mean, we have so many options at our fingertips. We have many, many specialists orthopedic doctors, neurosurgeons, um, you know, obviously trauma surgeons, the ER docs are good. Um, you know, our urologists will pitch in sometimes. Our gynecologists might pitch in if there's traumas to those certain areas of the body. Um, and we have good ICU. We've got good, you know, radiology and interventional radiology. Everything's running 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, the main difference between level two and level one is that level one ultimately kind of the buck stops there. The other main thing is that level one trauma centers um, are kind of required to um, to publish papers and contribute to the literature in trauma, um, which we just don't really do here. Um, So that's kind of the main difference. But a level two trauma center is a jewel of a community. Um, Does that does that mean ours is included in that? That the patients that they don't have to leave necessarily. Then right, that's got to be a big deal. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we I noticed I, I read a statistic recently. I think about 10 years ago, we were maybe seeing 600, 700 patients a year for as traumas. Um, in 2019, it was over 2,000. It was like 2,200. And so I would bet there's a very poor, uh, very low percentage of those are being transferred out to a higher level of care. Well, and the, you you said one of the reasons, too, that you, you moved out here and chose this area was because, A, the scenery, which, of course, it is beautiful. Those yeah. of us that have been here a long time. Uh, but there is stuff to do, right? So you've got the summer activities. You've right. got the lakes and the climbing in the winter, the snowboarding. In the, and so there's lots of trauma that can oh, come yeah. from that, obviously. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, having a <clears throat> level two is pretty important. Um, are there... Do you see busier times a year? Oh, absolutely. For, yeah. for, for, for trauma? Absolutely. It seems like it could be year round, but we do have some pretty major events here, I suppose. Yeah. That I mean, it, first of all, it is absolutely 100% year round. Um, even in the dead of winter, you could have a, a, a slow night of no traumas or you could have three in a row or four yeah. in a row. Who knows? Um, but by far, the summer is the busier time. So come like, you know, June time, that's when people are, you know, the numbers are increasing here. There are more people coming to the Black Hills for the summer. Um, just that alone brings more trauma. But we're also out and about and people are doing things. And uh, when you start to do things, you get into traumas. Um, I would say never underestimate, you know, a person's ability to do 
cause himself some sort of injury. It's, well, it's and we have incredible. such that short window of nice weather too that we try to pack as much in oh, as we absolutely. can. Absolutely. And sometimes we get stupid. Absolutely. So um, so June and July we're we're seeing a lot of traumas. Come the beginning of August, we get into everybody's you know mm. notorious time of year, which is the rally. Yep. Um, which you really can't talk about trauma here without talking about the rally. Um, when the rally hits, you know we're already kind of battle tested mm-hmm. because it's June and July have gone by. We're you know we're into the trauma season. Around July, we start to talk about it. We start to hint at it. We start to have meetings about it. Um, and then you know about the week ahead of time, it's kind of the pre-rally time where there's already a lot of bikers here. We're already starting to see the traumas rise. And then when the rally actually starts, it's just all hands on deck. And, you know, every, every aspect of trauma from the ER to the specialist to the trauma doctors, everybody kind of steps up their game. You know, there's usually more people on there's, you know, we, we normally have one surgeon trauma surgeon on and then a backup surgeon. But during the rally, those 10 days of rally, it's three deep at all times. Wow. At all times, and that's got to be. I mean, that's 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 a big number. I mean, it, oh, absolutely. three doesn't sound huge, but in 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 what you're dealing with, yes, it does. Yeah, no, it's three it's three twenty four hour shifts. You, you you know, somebody has to be on for twenty four hours, and and it can get tiring after a while. <laughs> I can't and there's not imagine. you know there's a fixed number of surgeons in our community, so having that and that has to be for you personally, because you've kind of you know you've obviously dedicated your life to this. This is what you want to do. Uh, as, as much as nobody wants to see you, yeah. um, that has to be just an exciting time though. I mean, those of you that have said, yep, this is what my profession is. You know, I want to be in those areas where obviously I can help the people that are going to end up yeah. having the problems. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it has to be rewarding, I guess is what I'm saying. It, it definitely has its moments mm-hmm. of, of sheer reward. Um, I would say that we have an excellent, excellent kind of team spirit in the ER here. We have an excellent trauma program, not just because of the surgeons, but because of all of the, you know, support team, all of the nurses, all of the other people that work in the ER. Um, people really know what they're doing there. Um, and that just makes it so much easier to walk in because as the surgeon, you want to walk in and be able to kind of step back and assess everything that's going on because you're the one making the calculations and the decisions. So when you have teammates and everybody knows what they're doing, the nurse is putting the IV in, there's another nurse documenting anything, the ER doc is helping, um, you know, there, you know, there's there's paramedics in the ER who are helping, there are the people drawing the blood, everybody just knows what they're doing, the radiologists, the radiology techs are there, everybody's there, the OR is on alert. When you have all of that just running really, really well, you can get a lot done um, and uh, it makes it fun. And it makes it efficient, and um, yeah, and it ends up being rewarding. That's what you're striving for. Um, is there anything I, I like to ask this question every once in a while, especially since you're in in an area where you know the the technology that comes out is is super important to to what you do. Mm-hmm. Is there new things that 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 are kind of on the horizon that you that get you excited? I know robotics <clears throat> are kind of a big part of a lot of yeah. stuff, but do you have do you have technologies you're like, man? I as soon as that gets here, I can't wait. <laughs> I mean, is there things like that that, that, um, you, that you look forward to? I don't or surprise have, you. I, I can't think of anything. Tr- trauma is a fairly mature um, field of medicine, and we, you know, like it's there. I'm sure there were times where we really needed things. For example, the CT scanner, as that mm. grew in popularity and it's become faster, it's become you know better um, digital enhancement and all those kinds of things. That's that's been a major breakthrough in trauma. Um, one thing that kind of came around the last maybe fifteen to twenty years was bedside ultrasound. We call it the fast exam. What we do is we take an ultrasound, and we're by no means you know excellent at ultrasounds. Ultrasound was originally invented for you know to assess um, you know fetuses in the mm-hmm. womb and things like that um, as sonogram. But uh, we use it now, and and we can quickly look at the heart and see how the heart's doing. We can quickly look at the kidneys and the abdomen and make sure there's no blood in there and things like that. Um, and so that's been huge because we've become very reliant on the CT scan, but there are, and the vast majority of trauma cases, you can come in, you can assess them. You're looking at their airway, breathing and circulation. If you see that they're stable, you send them down to the CT scanner. You let us scan everything we need to scan. We look inside, you know, someone may appear fine, but it turns out they have a laceration of their spleen and they have a few rib fractures and things. So the CT scan really helps us there. But there are times where the patient hasn't passed 
kind of our what we call our primary survey, our first you know, quick look at them. And that's what we call the ABCs of trauma, which is airway, breathing, and circulation. Um, and so if somebody's not protecting their airway, it's blocked in some way, that's priority number one because people will die in seconds to minutes. If they're not breathing well, then they're going to die in minutes. So we have to assess that. And then their circulation, which is their, you know, their heart and their blood. So we're looking at their heart rate and their blood pressure. If they don't pass those immediate tests, there's no time for them to go to a CT scanner. And that's where the ultrasound, where you just quickly take this probe and put it on their chest, um, can absolutely save somebody's life. Wow. And if we got a second, I'll give you kind of my, you know, my one of my most rewarding moments in yes, trauma. Yes, please. I was going to ask um, about that to wrap it up. Sure. Yeah. So um, there's basically, I, I kind of changed a little bit to kind of protect the patient information, but there were these two brothers and they were you know, having a party and they were drinking a lot of alcohol. Alcohol's involved in a lot of trauma. Mm. Um, and one of the brothers had kind of developed a jealousy of the other brother. And that night while drinking alcohol, it kind of turned into a jealous rage and he takes a knife and he stabs the brother in the chest. Now, luckily he didn't go very deep and that brother ended up being fine. But when he looked at what he had done, he was so horrified that he took the knife and then stabbed himself in the chest, just in the left upper chest, which right behind that is the heart. So he comes in and he's crying and all this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden he just kind of stops talking and he just, you know, passes out. And so we say, okay, that's airway and breathing. Let's put the breathing tube in. And we did that. And then we look at his vital signs and they're sort of changing and we get worried. Um, and so I t put the probe on his chest and I see that around his heart, there's some blood. And you know, the heart is an organ that's constantly expanding and contracting and it's pumping and pumping and pumping, but it's inside of its own little sac. So if the inside of that sac fills with blood, then it becomes kind of this compressed unit and the heart can't pump anymore and the blood pressure is going to go down. So that's what happened to him when he stabbed himself in the chest is that it started bleeding into that sac around his heart. And in an instant, his blood pressure dropped. And I had seen that there was blood on the ultrasound probe. So I immediately announced to everybody in the room, guys, we're not going to the CT scanner. We're doing something called an ED thoracotomy, which means in that moment, we have seconds probably, maybe up to a minute. I take a knife. I cut from the middle of his chest all the way across to the back. I go into his chest. I pull out this blood clot. And then I look at his heart and I saw that it's not really moving. So I cut that sack that was there and sucked out all the blood that was around it. And at the same time, the nurse was giving the patient adrenaline to kind of stimulate the heart. And then I did what's called open cardiac massage, where I take the heart in my hands and I start clapping to try to revive it. It's like CPR, but you have the heart in your hands, you're cradling it in your hands. And the combination of all that kind of stuff suddenly jolted the heart back. And um, in a second, we got him back alive. And um, you know, we packaged him up and we took him to the OR. Of course, at that point, the cardiac surgeon shows up and, oh, everything looks good here. Um, but um, that patient did well. He survived. He went home. And I saw him in the office months later. And I was like, man, you were dead. Like, let me see your scar. And he's like, oh, no big deal. I'm like, dude, you were dead. Do you realize I was holding <clears throat> your heart in my hand? Yeah, right? exactly. Like, I just, the whole time you're telling me this story, doctor, I'm like, what, what, what do you do for excitement? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> what can you possibly do after you leave that to be like, yeah, this is... God, this is exciting. <laughs> I get I get enough kicks at work. And when I go home, I'm ready just to relax. <laughs> well, and you've got kids, so you're I've constantly going oh, yeah. to have that excitement. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Witteroff, thank you so much for coming sure. in and talking today. Absolutely. Uh, I would love to hear, you know, down the road some more of these stories, too. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're fascinating. They're, they, if you if you, if you got a weak stomach, they make you cringe a little bit, but they're still... Yeah. Th what we're super super happy to have is what you're doing here in our community. Yeah. Because even as as traumatizing, to use a word, as these stories can be, you're so mm -hmm. thankful that if it happens to you, you've got a you know a level two trauma center here in Rapid yeah. City that can fix it. Yeah. So we have we have an excellent team, and uh, it's definitely a jewel of a community. Well, thank you very much for stopping in, Doctor. Sure. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks.